Okay, um, uh, welcome everyone uh, to the 2022 Haynes Lecture. Um, my name is Kevin Wilson. I, I teach in the English and Creative Writing Department, um, and, and it's uh, uh, my job to uh, introduce uh, the author Natasha Trethewey. Um, I, f I feel like I could take up an hour doing um, Natasha's bio of all the awards. Um, so I think I'll just only do 30 minutes and then we'll... Um, and Natasha Trethewey um, served two terms as the 19th Poet Laureate of the United States. She's the author of five collections of poetry, including Monument in 2018, which was long listed for the National Book Award, and Native Guard, which won the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, she's also the author of an incredible memoir, Memorial Drive, and a book of nonfiction, Beyond Katrina, a meditation on the Mississippi Gulf Coast, which appeared in 2010. Uh, she is the recipient of uh, so many fellowships from National Endowment for the Arts, Guggenheim Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, Bunting Fellowship Program of the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard. From 2015 to 2016, she was the poetry editor of the New York Times Magazine. Uh, in 2017, she received the Heinz Award for Arts and Humanities and in 2020, she received the Rebecca Johnson Bobbitt National Prize for Lifetime Achievement in Poetry from the Library of Congress. A member of both the American Academy of Arts and Letters and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, she was elected to the Board of Chancellors of the Academy of American Poets in 2019. At Northwestern University, she is Board of Trustees Professor of English in the Weinberg College of Arts and Sciences. Um, I first uh, learned of Trethewey and her work in, in 2000 uh, when I was an undergrad at Vanderbilt University and I was the student assistant to a poet there named Kate Daniels and she was putting together this event called uh, a millennial gathering of the writers of the New South which is like like uh, like the label of a Dr. Bronner's uh, soap you know like crazy crazy long title uh, um, and the purpose of it was to bring together 40 to 50 writers from the South to discuss literature, anticipate the future of Southern writing. And, and Trethewey's first book, which was called Domestic Work, was forthcoming later that year. Um, but I mean, one of the best things for me as an undergrad was I just tried as much as possible to read all the work that I could by these writers um, who were coming to the event. And to the real world. Um, but Trethewey, who was one of the youngest writers on these panels, struck me as someone. Go ahead, Kevin. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> there, sorry. All right, that will only happen like six or seven more times. <laughs> but Trethewey, who was one of the youngest writers on these panels, struck me as someone who was so clearly aware of these elements, how poetry and fiction and nonfiction could bear the weight of grief and find some way toward a future. And I was struck um, by a line in an interview where Trethewey said, after a woman who had listened to her reading asked Trethewey if she had any hope, and Trethewey said, do you not understand that the making of a poem is one of the most hopeful acts? People hear the trauma or they hear the despair and grief that lives still fully in me, and yet they don't see that it actually becomes a pathway to light. And so I've always looked to her work as she's become such a nationally recognized and beloved poet. And I was especially moved by her memoir, Memorial Drive, because it seems like a resonant example of Trethewey's work, uh, to look into the past, to find those hidden voices and lives and bring them into the present, to assert their place and to assert their importance. She is one of the most brilliant writers in America because she so clearly evokes all the aspects of this country, its history, and we could not be more lucky to have her here today. Please welcome Natasha Trethewey. 
Thank you, Kevin, for that lovely, lovely introduction and for bringing back those traumatic memories from the millennial gathering of writers of the New South. <laughs> Talk to me later and I will tell you stories. Thank you all for being here. I'm really honored to have been invited to give the Haynes Lecture today. And I'm going to read from my most recent book, which is my memoir, Memorial Drive. It is indeed a book about surviving traumas, both personal and national, about grief, about the abiding love and enduring bond between a mother and child. Against the backdrop of all those things, it is ultimately a book about becoming a writer. Eudora Welty, another Mississippian, wrote often about the importance of place in a writer's work. Location, she wrote, is the crossroads of circumstance. So I'm going to read a bit now from the prologue and then the first chapter of the book, which is called Another Country. The last image of my mother, but for the photographs taken of her body at the crime scene, is the formal portrait made only a few months before her death. She sat for it in a mass market studio known for its competent but unremarkable pictures. Babies coaxed to laughter by hand puppets, children in stair-step formation wearing matching Christmas sweaters, all against a common backdrop. Sometimes it's a sky blue scrim that looks as if it's been brushed with a feather or an autumn scene of red and yellow leaves framing a post and rail fence. For moodier portraits, as if to convey a sense of seriousness or formal elegance, there's the plain black scrim. She was 40 years old. For the sitting, she'd chosen a long sleeved black sheath, the high collar open at the throat, she does not look at the camera, her eyes fixed at a point in the distance that seems to be just above my head, making her face as inscrutable as it always was. Her high, elegant forehead, smooth and unlined, a billboard upon which nothing is written. Nor does she smile, which makes the cleft in her chin more pronounced, her jawline softly squared above her slender neck. She sits perfectly erect without looking forced or uncomfortable. Perhaps she intended to look back on it years later and say, that's where it began, my new life. I'm struck with the thought that this is what she must have meant to do, document herself as a woman come this far, the rest of her life ahead of her. Hindsight makes me see the portrait differently now, how gloomy it is, as if the photographer meant to produce something artistic rather than an ordinary studio portrait. It's as if he made of the negative space around her a frame to foreground some difficult knowledge, the dark past behind her, her face lit toward a future upon which her gaze is fixed. And yet, undeniably, something else is there, elegiac even then, a strange corner of light just behind her head, perhaps the photographer's mistake, appearing as though a doorway has opened, a passage through which, turning, she might soon depart. Looking at it now, with all I know of what was to come, I see what else the photographer has done. He shot her like this, her black dress black as the scrim behind her, so that, but for her face, she is in fact part of that darkness, emerging from it as from the depths of memory. Nearly 30 years after my mother's death, I went back for the first time to the place she was murdered. I'd not been there since the year I turned 19, when I had to clean out her apartment, disposing of everything I could not or would not carry with me, all the furniture and household items her clothing, her large collection of records. I kept only a few of her books, a heavy belt made of bullets, and a single plant she had loved, a Diffenbachia. Throughout my childhood, it had been my responsibility to tend it 
every week dusting and misting the upper leaves and snipping the browned lower ones. Be careful when you handle it, my mother warned, a small precaution, seemingly unnecessary, but there is a toxin in the sap of the Diffenbachia. It oozes from the leaves and the stems where they are cut. Dumb cane, the plant is called, because it can cause a temporary inability to speak. Struck dumb, we say, when fear or shock or astonishment renders us mute. Dumb grief, when the grief is not expressed in uttered words. I could not then grasp the inherent metaphor of the plant, my relationship with my mother, what it would mean that she had made its care my duty while warning me of its danger. When I left Atlanta, vowing never to return, I took with me what I had cultivated all those years, mute avoidance of my past, silence and willed amnesia buried deep in me like a root. Nor could I have anticipated then that anything would ever draw me back to that city, to a geography that held at every turn a reminder of a past I was determined to forget. Indeed, going back for work after accepting a university faculty position, I thought I could circumvent my former life, going out of my way to avoid at least the one place I could not bear to see, until I had to. To get there, I had to drive past landmarks that took me back to 1985, the county courthouse where the trials were held, the train station from which my mother traveled downtown to work, the DeKalb County Police Station at the intersection of Highway 285, the bypass loop around Metro Atlanta, and make my way down Memorial Drive, a major east-west artery once named Fair Street. It originates in the middle of the city, Memorial, and winds east from downtown, ending at Stone Mountain, the nation's largest monument to the Confederacy. A lasting metaphor for the white mind of the South, Stone Mountain rises out of the ground like the head of a submerged giant, the nostalgic dream of Southern heroism and gallantry emblazoned on its brow. In bas-relief, the enormous figures of Stonewall Jackson, Robert E. Lee, and Jefferson Davis. Not far from its base is the apartment we lived in that last year at the 5400 block of Memorial, number 18D. Though I knew exactly where it was, knew the landmarks leading up to it, I drove right past it first and had to double back to enter the tree-lined front gate. From there, I could see Stone Mountain in the distance, suddenly visible where Memorial crests, as if to remind me what is remembered here and what is not. The last time I was at the apartment complex, the morning after her death, I could see the faded chalk outline of her body on the pavement, the yellow police tape still stuck to the door, the small round hole in the wall beside her bed where a single bullet, a missed shot, had lodged. Nothing in the landscape today bears evidence to any of that, though everything seems to carry the imprint of loss. I keep an image in my head of myself from that first day after her death, at the apartment. There's a video recording of my arrival made by a local news station, and so the image is not only of those few moments, but of watching myself from a distance, entering my former life for what I thought to be the last time. In the footage, I walk up the stairs to the door and step in, shutting it behind me. When I think of it now, I don't hear any words, the volume on mute. Perhaps the reporter spoke our names, or perhaps she did not, calling my mother victim instead. And in my mind's eye, a caption fills the bottom of the screen. It identifies me as daughter of the murdered woman. Even then, I felt as though I were watching someone else, a young woman on the cusp of her life, adulthood and bereavement gripping her at once. The young woman I'd become walking out of that apartment hours later, was not the same one who went into it. It's as if she's still there, that girl I was, 
behind the closed door, locked in the footage where it ends. Often, I have seen that doorway in my dreams. Only now is it a threshold I can cross. The beginning of Another Country, the first chapter, begins with these lines from Shakespeare's sonnet number three. Thou art thy mother's glass, and she in thee calls back the lovely April of her prime. In the spring of 1966, when I was born, my mother was a couple of months shy of her 22nd birthday. My father was out of town traveling for work, so she made the short trip from my grandmother's house to Gulfport Memorial Hospital as planned without him. On her way to the segregated ward, she could not help but take in the tenor of the day, witnessing the barrage of rebel flags lining the streets, private citizens, lawmakers, Klansmen, often one and the same, raising them in Gulfport and small towns all across Mississippi. The 26th of April that year marked the 100th anniversary of Mississippi's celebration of Confederate Memorial Day, a holiday glorifying the Old South, the lost cause, and white supremacy. And much of the fervor was a display, too, in opposition to recent advancements in the civil rights movement. She could not have missed the paradox of my birth on that particular day, a child of miscegenation, an interracial marriage still illegal in Mississippi and in as many as 20 other states. Sequestered on the colored floor, my mother knew the country was changing, but slowly. She had come of age in the summer of 1965, turning 21 in the wake of Bloody Sunday, the Watts riots, and years of racially motivated murders in Mississippi. Unlike my father, who'd grown up a white boy in rural Nova Scotia, hunting and fishing, free to roam the open woods, my mother had come into being a black girl in the Deep South, hemmed in, bound to a world circumscribed by Jim Crow. Though my father believed in the idea of living dangerously, the necessity of taking risks, my mother had witnessed the necessity of dissembling, the art of making of one's face an inscrutable mask before whites who expected of blacks a servile deference. In the summer of 1955, when she was 11 years old, she'd seen what could happen to a black child in Mississippi who had not behaved as expected, stepping outside the confines of racial prescription in my grandmother's copy of Jet Magazine, Emmett Till's Battered Remains, His Destroyed Face. Even had my mother wanted to ignore the racial violence and increasing turbulence around her, my grandmother would not allow it. In her house, the latest issue of Jet lay on the coffee table beside a book of documentary photographs of the civil rights movement, images ranging from lynchings to peaceful protests and the resilient faces of black Americans, constant reminders of the necessity of fighting for justice in a state where the external reminders were increasingly unavoidable. The year before my mother met my father, the civil rights activist Medgar Evers had been gunned down in his driveway in Jackson. That year, 1963, my grandmother joined a group of black citizens in the Biloxi Wade Inn to protest being denied the right to use the public beaches. To mourn Evers, the protesters placed hundreds of black flags in the sand, an image my mother, watching from the seawall, would not forget. Nor would she forget hearing the news of the three civil rights activists working on the Freedom Summer campaign to register black voters in Mississippi. James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, and Michael Schwerner had been abducted and murdered in June 1964, their bodies found two months later, buried under the weight of an earthen berm in Neshoba County. When the news reached her, my mother was out of the state on a field trip with her college theater troupe. Back home, the Ku Klux Klan had initiated its campaign of terror, the Mississippi she returned to having grown even more frightening. That summer was a season of fires, of danger coming ever closer, flaming crosses and black churches burning all around the state. 
My mother and grandmother, living across the street from a church, slept less soundly then, awakening often in the night to listen. It was against that backdrop of imminence and upheaval that my parents, both college students at the time, fell in love. They met in a literature course on modern drama, and their conversations on books and theater propelled them from the classroom out into the afternoon sunlight as they walked the campus and beyond among the rolling green hills of Kentucky. When they eloped in 1965, traveling across the Ohio River into Cincinnati, where it was legal for them to be married, only my mother fully understood what this might mean for me, the child she was already carrying. In letters to my father during their months apart, she was at once sanguine and practical, hopeful for a changing nation, but also aware that any child she brought into the world would have much to learn in order to be safe. That meant I would need to understand the realities I would face, the painful, oppressive facts of a place slow to accept integration, even as it was now the law of the land. My father, idealistic in nature, was still naive enough to believe I could grow up as free of the burdens of race, of blackness, that is, as he was. They complemented each other, as opposites do. My mother, graceful and reserved, attentive to details. My father, with his rough manners, rowdy and bookish at once, often distracted by his thoughts. It was my mother who stanched the blood on my cheek when, after watching my father shaving, I tried using his straight razor. It had been my father, absent-minded, who'd left the razor on the counter within my reach. One day, when I cut my knee in the ditch outside, revealing what appeared to be a layer of white skin underneath, I lay between them, holding their hands up side by side, asking why they weren't the same color, why I didn't match either of them exactly. What was I? You have the best of both worlds, they said, not for the first time. Out in the world, alone with either of them, I was just beginning to feel a profound sense of dislocation. If I was with my father, I measured the polite responses from white people, the way they addressed him as sir or mister, whereas my mother would be called gal, never miss or ma'am, as I'd been taught was proper. So different was the treatment I received with each of them that I was unsure where or how I belonged. Only at home, the three of us together, did I feel profoundly theirs. And in that trinity of mother, father, and child, I would shut my eyes and fall asleep on the high bed between them. Outside that bedroom was a long, narrow hallway leading to the den and, just inside the door, a tall bookcase that held my attention countless afternoons. It housed my parents' books, along with a set of encyclopedias my mother had insisted my grandmother purchase instead of bronzing my baby shoes to commemorate my birth. In the earliest dream I can recall, that hallway led to something unknown by which I was both drawn and vaguely frightened, a hint of danger that lay before me. In the dream, I woke to a house so dark and quiet it seemed I was alone. I rose then and stood in the doorway, peering down the length of the hall. Opposite me, at the other end, blocking the bookcase, was a figure the size of a man, faceless and made entirely of the crushed shells that covered the driveway beside our house, the sharp edges I'd walked over barefoot countless times. It makes sense to me now that my earliest recollected dream took on such a shape. By then, my father was in graduate school part-time, working on his Ph.D. in English, becoming a writer. Had I told him what frightened me, he might have reminded me, as a comfort, that the imagery resembles some of the stories he recited to me at bedtime. The trials of Odysseus, his encounter with the Cyclops blocking the exit to the cave, the monster Grendel at the entrance to the Mead Hall in The Legend of Beowulf. Beyond those tales were the stories of Narcissus, Icarus, Cassandra, the Riddle of the Sphinx, stories about bravery, vanity, 
hubris, knowledge. The language of allegory and metaphor undergirded our days. My father believed, as the poet Robert Frost cautioned, that one must have a thorough education in figurative language. What I am pointing out, Frost wrote, is that unless you are at home in the metaphor, unless you have had your proper poetical education in the metaphor, you are not safe anywhere. Because you are not at ease with figurative values, you don't know the metaphor in its strength and its weakness. You are not safe in science. You are not safe in history. My mother, who'd majored in literature and theater in college, must have believed as well in the necessity of an education in metaphor. And yet, she was the direct one, less interested in abstractions and figures of speech than in more practical lessons, admonishments about dangers I could not yet imagine. I remember long walks with my father along the railroad tracks the sounds of poetry he'd recite as I picked flowers or blackberries for my mother. We'd gather pennies we left for the trains to flatten, and I'd walk with them clutched in my hands until my palms held the memory of every childhood scrape and cut the familiar scent of blood. At home, my mother would have corn pudding waiting for us, the kitchen warm and fragrant. On the windowsill, the jar of flowers I'd picked caught the afternoon sun and held it like bottled light. Everything a marvel, crawfish building chimneys pellet by pellet above their burrows, machinery at the shipyard and the great locomotives lurching at the railroad switch, the rhythm of language and the power of words to alter what I saw. Look out the window, my father said. He had been entertaining me with a wolf hand puppet and the story of Little Red Riding Hood. See that wolf out there, he asked, pointing to my great aunt Sugar, who was at that moment transformed, a wolf in a day dress and hat walking upright through the woods behind our house. Even my mother, shelling peas at the kitchen sink, had looked outside and laughed. We were safe. Nothing outside would harm us. This was the place of my childhood wonder, of my parents' fleeting happiness, my unquestioning belief that my life would be always just as it was then, in the close arrangement of daily life with my mother's family. We lived with my grandmother, right next door to my Aunt Sugar, on the small plot of land where my great-grandmother's house had stood. Surrounding us was a wider radius of people who had grown up with my elders, many of them, like us, charting their family history back to when the small section of town called North Gulfport had been a settlement of former slaves. There was the community center built by Mennonite missionaries where I took swimming lessons, an Elks Lodge where Uncle Son had been a member since the 50s, several churches and just as many small nightclubs and juke joints, including Son's Owl Club, where my mother, as a girl, had helped choose records for the jukebox, and where my grandmother had worked the kitchen on weekends making gumbo or red beans and rice. There was also a baseball field where Son's team played, my father as catcher, the only white player on the diamond. Down the street, the Gulf and Ship Island line ran north-south toward Jackson, beside Old Highway 49. Just a few yards from my grandmother's house, flanking her driveway, was the new Highway 49, a busy four-lane road stretching over what had been a pasture. At night, I could hear the sound of a train going by from one direction, the long whistle as it met the crossing at the four corners, and on the other side, the rumble of 18 wheelers that shook the ground and rattled our windows. Nestled between the two, our tiny patch of native geography seemed, to my child's eye, vast. When I began to go out with both my parents, outside the confines of North Gulfport to a store or the movie theater, I watched the ways white people responded to us. That my parents were beautiful would have been reason enough to stare. But in Mississippi in the late 60s and early 70s, it had only been a few years since the beaches were integrated to comply with national law, and the schools were yet to be fully desegregated across the state. Ross Barnett, the former governor, 
was monitoring interracial activity, and my grandmother had been on the list of people to watch ever since she tried to place my parents' 1965 wedding announcement in the local newspaper. Separation of the races was still the way of things, maintained by custom, if not upheld by law, and my parents and I met with a great deal of hostility most places we went. I could see it on the faces of the white people we encountered, how even the nicer ones just shook their heads, whispering, such a cute little thing, too bad she's black. How others stared at us, sucking their teeth. Sometimes this hostility turned to outright intimidation, someone following us out of Woolworths to the car, my mother gripping my father's arm to prevent him turning around and engaging the man behind us, someone else driving slowly by the house, glaring at us as we sat on the front porch, a group of three or four men accosting my father on his way home from work on the docks, asking, what's wrong with you? Why you living among the niggers? My mother and grandmother, having lived with this kind of attention, were accustomed to scrutiny and intimidation, a stream of headlights searching the front windows of the house at night, the sexually charged calls from white men driving by in broad daylight. In the late 50s and early 60s, my grandmother had given shelter to several Mennonite missionaries who came to North Gulfport to teach repair the dilapidated housing of the very poor, and minister to the community. For weeks at a time, these young white missionaries would stay at her house, and it wasn't long before their presence and the work they were doing was noticed by local whites. First, there was a bomb threat directed at the Bible camp where the Mennonites were believed to be promoting integration, the camp my mother attended. Then, the Ku Klux Klan threatened to bomb the Mount Olive Baptist Church across the street. Undeterred, my grandmother began to sleep with a pistol beneath her pillow. In spite of the danger, she was adamant in her belief that she must do this work, must open her doors to help. A moral obligation, she called it. Though my mother and my grandmother met all of this with a similar stoicism, they responded differently. My mother was averse to guns, to confrontation, whereas my grandmother saw guns as a necessity, telling me countless times the way to confront a would-be intruder. First, fire a warning shot, she said, and if they keep coming, aim at the legs, shoot to wound. Those words marked my first awareness that any danger we might face was not limited to the world outside our close-knit community, the radius of those houses, but could come right to us, right up into the yard, perhaps even the front door. Though I was too young to recall the night the Klan burned a cross in our driveway, I heard the story again and again, and the night lives in my memory as experience. I see it as though watching a scene in a documentary, silent but for the metal box fan in the window, a whirring sound like an old movie projector. The men arrive late in the evening, long after supper, my parents still sitting together in the den, watching television, my grandmother and my uncle Charlie in the kitchen, washing the last of the dishes. All of them dead now. I see them moving through the house like ghosts. Even I am a ghost in this story, an infant self of whom I have no recollection, my inscrutable face still white as my father's. My grandmother peers through the blinds at the group of them, seven or eight men in white robes carrying a man-sized cross. In the bedroom, my mother watches over me, the blackout curtains drawn, all the lights in the house extinguished so that, but for the faint glow of a hurricane lamp in the corner, we are all in darkness, my father and uncle, rifles in hand, waiting silently in the front room as, outside, the fire ignites. In my grandmother's house, the act of remembering, recounting that story, was meant to ensure my future safety, protection gained through knowledge and the vigilance it, it brings, a certain hyper-awareness, hair rising on the back of my neck when I hear a particular kind of Southern accent, a tissing, tensing in my spine when I'd see the Confederate flag or the gun rack on a truck following us too closely down the road. <laughs> 
within the tight circle of extended family, with their watchful interventions into my daily life, I felt protected, insulated from racial intimidation and violence, regardless of the ferment all around us. That so many of my relatives were around me made the routine absences of my father less pronounced. It was part of the natural order of things that he would be gone for some time, following which I'd see him for a while before he departed again. A year after I was born, he had taken a commission as an officer in the Royal Canadian Navy and, after his initial training in British Columbia, spent most of 1967 and part of 1968 on a destroyer, the Centennial, cruising around the world to commemorate Canada's 100th anniversary. One of the few photographs I have of the three of us together is a formal portrait taken in 1969 in my grandmother's den. It was the last photograph we'd take together as a family. My father sitting on a wooden armchair, my mother balanced on the arm, her long legs crossed, and me in between them, puckish in a green dress. I see in that photograph now my grandmother's desire for commemoration. Most pictures we had were snapshots taken casually, but for this one, my grandmother had called in a photographer. Two years after the Supreme Court had ruled in Loving v. Virginia that laws prohibiting interracial marriage were unconstitutional, it was as if she wanted the formality of a professional portrait to make visible the legitimacy of my parents' union, our family, in a place where we were still seen as an aberration. My father had a different kind of commemoration in mind. In the aftermath of the loving decision, he'd wanted to take a trip someplace where our color differences might be less noticeable, where my mother might be able to relax. Ignoring her qualms about the dangers of a long journey over a thousand miles, my father bought a used Lincoln Continental to get us to Mexico. I have a vague recollection of the seemingly endless stretch of blacktop, how that long car seemed to float above it as I dozed on the back seat. The sun hung low and heavy as we drove toward it. We were still three years from the end of their marriage, but the best of our days together already lay behind us in the darkening distance. What has stayed with me vividly from that trip, inscribed in the way that traumatic events draw a map of connections in the brain, is my near drowning in the hotel pool. My father was always reading, and so I imagine he must have gone inside to retrieve a book, leaving my mother poolside as I splashed in the shallow end. I don't recall how I ended up in the deeper section. For what seemed a long moment, I was suspended there, looking up through a ceiling of water, the high sun barely visible overhead. I don't recall being afraid as I sank, only that I was enthralled by what I could see through that strange and wavering lens. My mother, who could not swim, leaning over the edge, arms outstretched, reaching for me. She was in the line of the sun, and what she did not block radiated around her head, her face like an annular eclipse, dark and ringed with light. I have just one photograph as a record of our journey. In it, I am alone. There are mountains in the distance behind me, and I am sitting on a mule. On the back, in my father's elegant script, Tasha, Monterey, 1969. Of all the photographs of my early childhood, this one, I can see it now, shows me what each of my parents, in different ways, needed me to know. It was my father's idea to place me on the back of the mule, my father who, perhaps oblivious to his own metaphors of animal husbandry, had referred to me in one of his poems as a crossbreed. The photograph was perhaps his version of a linguistic joke, the sight gag of a mixed-race child writing her namesake, animal origin of the word mulatto. My mother, knowing very well what the visual metaphor meant, could not have thought it was funny. They would have agreed only that I needed to understand it. You are not safe in science. You are not safe in history. Whatever hope she'd had early on, 
when they were first in love and thinking that love might be enough to challenge, to counter the challenges of racism I would face, the country had by then shown her otherwise, that love alone would not protect me. She knew that as a mixed race child, halfway between them, I would ultimately be alone in the journey toward an understanding of self, my place in the world, yet carrying the invisible burdens of history born on the back of metaphor. She knew, too, that language would be used to name and thereby attempt to constrain me, mongrel, mulatto, half-breed, nigger, and that, as on the back of the mule, I would be both bound to and propelled by it. My mother wanted only that I not be destroyed by it. Thank you. so much for that wonderful reading. Um, I think we have some time for questions, if uh, people would like to. Oh, the awkward silence. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it took me a very long time to write it. Um, I first said that I was going to write it in 2012, and it took me seven years. Um, and really, the only thing, um, I spent most of that time writing the first chapter that I read to you from, because I didn't want to leave it. Because I knew when I left that place, Mississippi, I had to tell the rest of the story. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. Justice. <laughs> um, I'm from Gulfport. My <laughs> well, hello. <laughs> my dad was the principal of IOD during uh, Hurricane Katrina. Yeah. Um, what is your last memory of Mississippi as you left it? Um, is there anything of Gulfport that you like? try to return to that like doesn't cause you tension? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. I wonder if you ask it because you feel that way sometimes too. I mean, I have to notice that if I fly to Jackson, the moment I touch down, I, something starts to happen that I get tense, like I'm ready for something to happen. Um, but I love the balminess of the coast. Um, you know, I, I spent so many years in Atlanta and I felt landlocked because I grew up by this water. So I think when I feel the, the balmy air, the wind, that makes me happy and, and think about the parts of that place and childhood that I liked so much. Yeah. Yes. Could you speak a little louder? I'm sorry. I, the last thing I heard was um, you were reading My Mother Dreams in Other Country. Yeah. Jayan. <laughs> so I uh, asked my students to write about your, you know, poems uh, at Swanee and in Parchment Prison. And, you know, they were like, you know, writing about, you know, what your uh what it means by your mother's, uh, you know, another country. Mm -hmm. So could you expand on, could you like elaborate on like, you know, what you like imagine because you use like my, my mother dreams another country, like in your poetry collection. Right. 
So, so in the poem, My Mother Dreams Another Country, um, this is me imagining my mother at, at the moment that she is uh, awaiting uh, my birth. She's back in Mississippi. It's 1966. It's illegal for her to be married to her husband. And, uh, you know, the, the governor, former governor is monitoring interracial activity in the state. My mother knows fully well the world in which she is about to bring a child. So when she dreams another country, I think she's dreaming of a country where I will be safe and loved and justice for all will reign. Yes. Uh, can, can can we give yeah. her? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, are there any nuances that you see in yourself, but not so much other people that you think came from your experiences? Well, um, you know, we're all such nuanced human beings who contain multitudes. And yet, I do think that um, there are ways that our vision, our perception of things is shaped. And because I was in that particular world, because I had the opportunity to go out with both my parents or go out with one or the other of my parents, the one race, one gender, you know, I, I could see all of the subtle ways that they were being treated differently that is somehow hard to convey to people who haven't experienced it themselves. There's a, I don't need it. <laughs> uh, there's a big Navy presence, a big, um, uh, what's it called, the CP base. Yeah. Gulfport. Mm -hmm. uh, so this was also during the time of Vietnam. Mm -hmm. There were memories of, of the war or what was going on in the city there at that time. You know, I have very few memories of that, though um, I, I tried writing this poem. I actually, I tried writing this poem and it, it didn't work. And finally, the scene that I was writing about makes its way into Memorial Drive, um, where uh, my mother and I went to a movie theater in downtown Gulfport to see one of the ubiquitous sort of war films that was out, uh, probably about World War II. Um, but it was out at that moment. Um, and I remember toward the end, you know, there was like some scene where the, all the soldiers were, you know, in a bunker uh, or in the trench or something, they were supporting each other. And it just looked like such this moment of camaraderie that people were brought together in a common experience because of war. But I was a child. And so I said very wistfully, wow, I hope there's a war when I grow up. <laughs> and my mother, <laughs> you know, yanked me out of that seat and sort of dragged me up the aisle. It was one of the moments that I had, I knew that I had deeply disappointed her, you know, because I was wishing for a war. What I was wishing for was that shared humanity that was bringing people of very different races and everything together. Um, but that's, that's mostly my memory of that time and place, though I do know I, this is a thing I write about that my, um, my mother's second husband, the man that she married when we moved to Atlanta was a Vietnam veteran troubled. Mm -hmm. Yes. Traveled there has has any of that uh, 
So um, I've written more about my father's whiteness than his Canadianness. Um, but you know, I have to say this because you made me think of this. Um, this when I was born, and you know, it was illegal. Um, my the person who filled out my birth certificate wrote race of mother, colored race of father, Canadian. <laughs> I have traveled to Canada many times with my father. My father was also a poet. Um, and so I, I know that side of my family. Um, I have written a book of poems to have a conversation about um, the deeply ingrained and often uh, unexamined ideas of race, racial difference and racial hierarchy that were first codified by enlightenment philosophers that my father, as much as he loved me, still could not completely unyoke himself from. My father, because he was a poet, he was both uh, one of my earliest teachers early on, but I was actually a student in his graduate class too. I took my father's poetry class when I went to Holland's University for my MA in creative writing. I am working on a memoir about my father now. I think it's a book that, if this was about why I write, it's a book about how I became a writer. And it has everything to do with um, a kind of received knowledge, but also the moment when one has to push back against received knowledge. Um, and in that way, I think it is a kind of microcosm of race in America. Uh, let's see. Yes, right here. Um, well, you know, I, I've written, I'm an autobiographical poet, and so I've written so much of what appears in Memorial Drive in poems. Um, if you read them side by side, you would see uh, scenes, uh, photographs that I've written about in several of my books, but always the opportunity to look at an image differently and to see figuratively what else it might tell. Um, this, for me, demanded a different kind of treatment because I'd never intended to write a memoir. And the reason that I decided to write this one is that the more... Um, I was becoming known as a writer. After the Pulitzer, after being named US Poet Laureate, I would be written about, you know, critics, uh, newspaper writers, magazine writers. And often my mother would enter that because my backstory, they, they would always write something about my backstory. Um, and in that backstory was a murdered woman. Um, sometimes in that backstory was a father who was a poet. But the part that was bothering me the most was the way that my mother um, was being erased or diminished or marginalized um, and not being shown um, in the fullness of her humanity. And the absolute and ongoing role that she played in making me the person and the writer that I am. So I decided that if she was going to continue to be mentioned, I was the one that was going to tell the story. Yes. Last one. So obviously you write about a lot of more difficult topics and a lot of trauma that you've experienced. And in that way, I think that's part of why your work touches so many lives. Mm -hmm is because people can see themselves in it or they can see, they can come to relate to you and to know you better um, through your work. And it's kind of that sense that you mentioned earlier of like the war where people are brought together in this camaraderie um, through something that is truly terrible. So do you have any advice for people who want to write things about turning their own experiences and their own troubles and their own wars, so to speak, into an experience and a, an opportunity for camaraderie for others. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you know, I think that that's a good question. Um, you know, one of the reasons I talk about, um, you know, my birth on Confederate Memorial Day, you know, all these things that just sort of seem like destiny. Um, but from an early age, I think I understood that my personal history was the story of America, that, that this is a story that's not just mine. You know, the feminist movement told us that the personal is political. So our personal stories can do that work. You know, the range of experiences is unending, but the range of human emotion is small. And when we touch each other's hearts, you know, because we've all felt loss or sorrow or joy, that's what makes the writing universal. Thank you. Thank you very much for a wonderful, beautiful reading. Um, thank you all for coming. Thank you for uh, for listening. Um, and I also, before before we depart, uh, want to thank Stacy Haynes and uh, the Haynes family uh, for their support of the Haynes lectures um, for these many decades. Um, and uh, and once again, thank you, Tasha Trethaway. <laughs>